Hello everybody, I'm Ampere Beep, and welcome back. As we talked about where are we now and where are we going, today's video is gonna be on how did we get here. This video is gonna be a little bit different as we have to go backwards in time to see how we got to the point we are right now and why we are dealing with the problems we're dealing with right now. I'd love to see you guys in our Discord server. We have quite a few members finally, and we've been having some really good discussions on regional housing needs, looking at what future transit plans might be, and planning meetups. I've got bad news though. The California High Speed Rail board meeting for this month has been canceled. I was going to go there in person and record it since it was going to be relatively close to where I live, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. I assume that they couldn't get space for the board meeting because even at the last board meeting, they didn't have the exact location yet. Thank you everybody for all your support so far. I've been blown away by how many people have watched the videos and put comments down. This is more than I ever thought I would ever have, so I'd just like to thank everyone. That being said, let's jump right into it. So let's get started by going over what has happened since the last video. The last video happened this point in time, and since then we have gotten a few new road closures. Along with Lacey Boulevard, which is the boulevard directly south of the Hanford Viaduct, right before it crosses 198, that has gained a road closure through July 2024, along with shoulder closures on State Route 198, which is the main highway going underneath the viaduct. They are closing the shoulders on the north and south sides to, I assume, put in concrete supports, which is great news. That will allow us to start moving along on that part of the viaduct, which has had far less progress than I would have liked to have seen. We have a few closures in Fresno along H. Divisadero and Roosevelt Avenue. If I open that up right now, we will see that this is right here. So this is the Fresno Trench and the SR-180 passageway. This is Divisadero Street as it crosses the alignment, and they are going to be doing some closures here and here and detouring around, which is good because there are quite a few utility relocations that still need to be done here. You can see there are roughly two power lines that need to be relocated here and probably underground utilities that I don't know about. So this is great news. Moving on for the most recent one, a uh, road closure along El Paso Road in Madera. This is for several utility relocations, and as you can see right here, El Paso Road is right here next to Avenue 18 and half, which, if we look at it on the map, is right here near the Madera station for uh, Amtrak, right by Road 26. So they are closing this so they get some utility relocations done, I'm assuming power lines. And as for right now, those are all of the new road closures and detours that have been posted to the authorities' website. Now we can move on to updates to Sentinel Hub two or three times since the last video. Uh, the first one was very cloudy, so there was not much to see, but there was one on Sunday, I believe Sunday the 9th, and on Wednesday the 13th or 14th, one of those. As we can see, it is very clear out, which is very good for us because we can go to EOS Land Viewer and do A-B testing on the alignment. I have found, I've noticed some significant changes in a few areas that I'd like to point out right now. The first one is Magnolia Avenue. Now Magnolia Avenue is being relocated with the new Pond Road grade separation. And you can see right here, the left is the newest imagery and the right is the imagery from the last video. We can see as I cross it here that they have now filled in the embankment here and have paved the new alignment for Magnolia Avenue again. For a while, Magnolia Avenue still connected here and they had it closed through the alignment and and they allowed vehicles to travel along this and it, it met at a T intersection right here. They have redone it now and now it is set to its final configuration where the road curves to the east a little bit, which is great news. We can move onwards. We can see some work has been done at this canal here. This is, I believe, the canal that had some cracking that requires them to completely drain it and that will happen sometime later this month. So by the time the next video happens, we should see CP4 fully completed. Following that, we have Schofield Avenue, which connects the Garces Highway Viaduct through this north part here where Schofield Avenue has to be relocated. And we can see that compared to the last time, the right of way for the road has been completely removed. We should be seeing this paved in the next week or two. So some very exciting times for CP4. Keep in mind, the only other area that's under construction at the moment is this canal relocation right here. The next area I noticed as having changes is Avenue 120. You can see right here, the right of way for the alignment, which goes around Angiola here, is not fully clear. But as of now, you can see they've cleared it all and have cleared this part here on the north side of Avenue 120, as well as this segment right here. And you can also see that they have gotten the alignment cleared as well, and potentially sub roadbed laid for the new roadway that they will be constructing here. Now here's the biggest news. As I had stated in the last video, the Thule River Viaduct has had its first girder transported to the site. And now, as you can see, as I bring this across, there it is. We have the first girder for the Thule River Viaduct and Pergola. This is incredible. Now, the most recent Pergola that had started construction was the Conejo Viaduct, which they installed most of the girders by June of last year, after starting in February of last year. So we should start seeing this move along very
very rapidly. Now the next construction area that needs to be focused on is the Hanford Viaduct. Now right here, you can see at the north end right here, some of the deck is finished. The concrete is unwrapped. Now keep in mind, this is roughly three weeks or two weeks of difference. So these are gonna be a lot larger than you normally would see between two different Sentinel-2 imagery updates, but this is great news. And what you can also see is some formwork being installed on the south side of State Route 198. Not much work has been done south of the San Joaquin Valley Railroad alignment because I feel like they are focusing on getting ready for girder installation on the south side here, as well as getting the piers installed next to Lacey and the railroad alignment. We can move north a little bit here where you can see that the land is continuing to be cleared southwards. I believe this is final land clearing before they start building up the embankments as the embankment from the Hanford Viaduct will continue south to about here. We move north, you can see Fargo Avenue, which has been building up its embankment over time. And according to the road closure website, this should continue through the end of this month. That's it for the updates on existing construction. Now let's get into the topic of today's video. How did we get here? It all started long before in 1996 with the creation of the California High Speed Rail Authority. Over time, this authority was not meant to construct a system. It was just meant to plan and propose different alignments, as well as determine what the best alignments could be. Then, in 2006, the first High Speed Rail bond measure was proposed. This led them to move on to 2008's election. This time, it passed. And despite what many has said that the project was originally proposed to be $30 billion, nowhere in the bond measure does it actually say that? We have the exact legislative text right here for Assembly Bill 3034, which was the basis of Prop 1A. And if I control F here, we can search for 30 billion. And we only have four matches for 30 here. We can look for 33. There's only four matches. And we can search for cost. And nowhere here does it say anything about a total cost of the project. What it does say is what the bond money would be in an exact dollar amount and what it would be needed to be used for. What it also says is the high-speed train will cost about one-third of what it would cost to provide the same level of mobility and service with highway and airport improvements. As we move further up, we can see that this was started in April of 2008. It passed the Assembly and Senate by August, approved by the governor by the end of August, and it was filed with the Secretary of State the same day it was approved by the governor. This led it to be put on the November 4th, 2008 election ballot. As you can see here on Ballotpedia, a website that I actually think is pretty useful when looking at different elections, as it has a lot of data in a really easy to access format. It also allows you to see different politicians and what they stand for. Now we can move forward. Here's the timeline that we can look at here. November 2013, the Sacramento Superior Court ruled that the High Speed Rail Authority did not follow the requirements found in the provisions of Proposition 1A. They prohibited the state from spending $8 billion in bonds until the requirements were met, including identifying $25 billion in additional funds. In 2014, former Governor Jerry Brown signed into the budget an allocation for 25% of the cap-and-trade program's revenue to the high-speed rail system. This money continues to this day and will expire, I believe, in the year 2030, at which point it will be extended most likely until 2045. And only and only in January 2015 did construction start on the high-speed rail project. Now, up until January 2018, the high-speed rail authority has, from what I believe, to be an inexperienced CEO, which caused a multitude of problems, including significant delays, poor planning, poor execution, and ultimately causing significant delays that we are dealing with to this day. In 2018, our current CEO of the California High Speed Rail Authority, Brian Kelly, was sworn into office. Ever since that point, Brian Kelly has been working very hard to make sure the project is ready to actually start work on every new project section and is actively trying to reduce the problems that caused the delays to begin with. And then in February 2019, our current governor, Gavin Newsom, said the infamous words that the project would cost too much and take too long, and that there wasn't enough oversight or transparency. This was skewed by many media sources as saying that the project was canceled, even though that was never said by the governor. What this meant was the focus for the entire project was now on Merced to Bakersfield, instead of everything at once, which spread the resources of the authority very thin and encouraged bad planning. The following day, former President Trump announced that he would ask the state to return the three and a half billion dollars granted to them through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This officially occurred on February 19th, 2019, as the Department of Transportation officially announced it. This officially removed $929 million of the 3.5 billion that was allocated to the project by the federal government from the grant applications that were posted in 2010 to help recover from the Great Recession. Cost estimate here is not relevant to what we're talking about today. And finally, in 2021, our current president, Joe Biden, and the U.S. Department of Transportation restored 
$929 million that was taken away by the former Trump administration back to the High Speed Rail Authority. This gave the project a much needed cash infusion, as in the aftermath of the project losing that $929 million grant caused the project to stall rapidly. This was compounded with the COVID-19 pandemic, which significantly reduced the amount of workers that were allowed on site and required all High Speed Rail Authority members to work remotely, which further complicated contact between them. Now, where did these $33 billion estimated costs come from if it wasn't put in the assembly bill? Now we can see here all of the officials that supported it, California Democratic Party, which is not a surprise to anyone, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Representative Jim Costa, Representative Zoe Lofgren, Assemblymember Fiona Ma, and Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Organizations that also supported it were California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Kern County Taxpayers Association, California Public Interest Research Group, the California League of Conservation Voters, National Resources Defense Council, California State Association of Counties, and the League of Women Voters of California. Now right here, we can see that even in the arguments for the project, a total cost was not given. It does say without raising taxes, which was put in Assembly Bill 3034, which was the basis of this ballot proposal. What it also said is a billion dollars of that money would be given to commuter rail systems that connect to the train system. This right here confirms that the High Speed Rail Authority was not meant to start construction in 1996, but meant to study and plan a route. For context, this is the yes vote in a voter guide. And now we move on to the no vote. The opponents are the California Libertarian Party, the Council for Citizens Against Government Waste, the California Taxpayer Protection Committee, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, the Reason Foundation, the California Chamber of Commerce, and the California Farm Bureau Federation. And only here was a total cost estimate given. Now we can see exactly where all these numbers are coming from and all of the terms that the news keeps running with every single year and every single month that it comes out. $20 billion cost for taxpayers, the word boondoggle, which you will see so often on anti-high-speed rail news articles. Taxpayers would foot this bill, it's not free money. And as we continue downwards, the total cost is estimated to be over 40 billion and some experts expect it to reach 100 billion. Even in the only location on the ballot that it said any number remotely close to $33 billion, they also noted $100 billion. And this was written by opponents to the project. As we can see here, editorials were posted in support and in opposition of this. I'm pretty sure everybody knows why one would support this. The San Diego Union Tribune, which is well known to be anti-transit, noted 40 billion plus project. This is where the repeated rehashing of the exact same information comes from. And the Oakland Tribune, which says boondoggle express rail system. This is where boondoggle comes from, which for some reason is used in every anti-high-speed rail post. As you can see here, it was originally slated to appear on the November 2nd, 2004 ballot, but it was moved to the 2006 ballot. Another bill moved it to the 2008 ballot. So this ballot had been delayed by four years already. With that out of the way, now we can see why are the costs rising so much recently. And here is the biggest cost increase that was not proposed to be included in the original construction. Intrusion protection barrier walls. Intrusion protection barrier walls are a concept that is used to protect high-speed trains from freight derailment. But in 2008, when this project was proposed, this was not a requirement from the federal government. What did happen was in 2019, the Federal Railroad Administration implemented a new requirement for intrusion protection barrier walls. As it says here, a critical safety measure to avoid possible possible train derailments onto another party's tracks. And as you can see here, you can see the intrusion protection barrier walls being installed here. As you see here, to meet RF funding objectives, contracts were issued between 2013 and 2016 before all right-of-way was secured and some technical requirements were determined. This right here is the direct explanation of why construction started before it should have. To meet the funding deadline for the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act grants, construction had to begin before 2017 and utilize all $3.5 billion that had been allocated to them, or else the money would have been taken away. This would have been a game over scenario for the project, which at that point had only received state funding. As you can see right here, these are unprecedented requirements. The FRA was concerned with freight derailment next to the high-speed rail line, which resulted in them implementing this new requirement. Interestingly enough, this is the only project it would be applied to. Additionally, there was no precedence for this anywhere else on earth for systems of the speed that was being required or the weight of the trains being run. As you can see here, it resulted in 38 of the 119 miles that were under construction needing an intrusion protection barrier wall to be built. This is determined by anywhere high-speed rail is less than 102 feet, the center line of the rails, by the way, to a freight line. These were the different types of intrusion protection barriers, one of which was an embankment that was eliminated, or a 10-foot deep ditch, which was also eliminated, a standalone berm, which increased the area that the high-speed rail line would need to use, and a concrete barrier.
barrier wall, which is what they use for the majority of the alignment except for in CP4, which caused additional problems. Now you can see here, as of 2020, these were the additional costs associated with the new intrusion protection barrier walls. CP1, which is only 31 miles, added $282 million to the total cost. And CP23, this was not even determined yet. And this is the longest alignment. And CP4, five and a half miles at $35 million. So as you see right here, this is already $300 million added onto the cost because of a sudden last minute change to a regulation by the Federal Railroad Administration. Suspiciously enough, which only applied to this one specific project because it was alongside existing freight railroad right-of-ways. I am all for safety, but if it comes at a significant additional cost, there must be a different way to resolve the conflicts. What this also meant is that in areas that were very urbanized, like the Fresno area, they needed to use the concrete barrier wall, which is the most expensive, the entire time. This also required in changes to the Fresno Trench to allow for the weight applied to the secant piling walls to be designed in for. This also significantly delayed CP23, as there is a significant portion of the alignment that is alongside the freight rail right-of-way. This resulted in them buying out more right-of-way than they originally had anticipated and requiring them to move the tracks farther away than they normally would have, as can be seen right here. This means that the area covered by freight railroads and the high-speed rail alignment is nearly 200 feet wide. With all of these changes, they managed to value engineer these changes down significantly. And finally, we can look at what these grants are that have been allocated to the authority. This grant strategy is directly targeted at the current infrastructure bills funding grants, one of which is going to be announced at the end of this month. The authority is aiming for a 50-50 or 60-40 federal to state funding ratio, as mega projects like this are usually funded by federal governments as they can put significant strain on local funding sources. As you can see here, the R grant provided High Speed Rail with $2.5 in federal funding, which was fully expended by October 2017, and they had to have the state match requirement of $2.5 by 2023, which they achieved one year ahead of schedule. The fiscal year 10 grant, which totaled $929 million, which was taken away under the Trump administration, was given back in 2021 and will be spent starting next summer. They also have the RAISE grant, which is going to be used for expansion and redesign of the State Route 46 underpass, as well as its intersection with State Route 43 on the east side of Wasco. This is added on to $600,000 brownfields and was specifically allocated to the LA to Anaheim segment. This all totals to $3.5 billion. There are two grant applications currently under federal review, one of which being for the rehabilitation of the Fresno historic train station, which amounts to $8.5 million, roughly half of the total project cost, and the Merced Extensions design, which totals $25 million. The total cost of the design should be $41 million, roughly. And if I remember correctly, that is already, both of these grants have already been received. And now we move on to the bipartisan infrastructure law. I've talked a bit about this in the last video, so I don't think I need to talk about that. Overall, thank you guys for watching. I'd love to see you guys in the Discord server. We have great discussions and we talk about transit, new construction, and generally local projects everywhere. I'd also love to hear in the comments section down below what else you would like to hear from me, or any information you'd like me to go over in the future videos. And that'll be it. Thanks for dropping by.